Okay. Well, given that we're one minute past, we will go ahead and get started. Um, but we will keep this session relatively informal. So please feel free to jump in um, with any <laughs> tech issues or questions. Um, welcome everyone to this session on the future of open science policy, open source scientific hardware. Really excited to talk to all of you about um, open science hardware and the, the relationship to open science. Um, I, I, I'm Allison Parker. I'm a senior program associate with the Science and Technology Innovation Program at the Wilson Center, which is a, th a think tank, quasi-federal um, in DC, um, and also a member of the board of directors of the Open Science Hardware Foundation, relevant for our discussion today. Um, so yeah, today we're going to talk about open hardware, open science hardware. Um, and, you know, as we've seen from the last session and from this entire conference, uh, the growth of open science and open source within the scientific community really represents a paradigm shift. Um, and we're seeing more collaborative, transparent, and efficient research infrastructure. Um, and open source hardware is a part of that. So um, for those of you that may not be aware, open source hardware, which is also sometimes just called open hardware, um, are hardware designs that are made freely and publicly available for study, modification, dis distribution, production, and sale. Um, and then open science hardware is a bit of a um, alternative definition or expansion of that definition to think about physical tools used for science. So the ones most relevant for our conversation today, um, again, that can be obtained, assembled, used, studied, modified, shared, and used by anyone. Um, so we're thinking about things like lab equipment, auxiliary materials like sensors, biological reagents, analog and digital electronic components. You know, there's a whole range of of tools and equipment that we could bring into the discussion today. Um, but I think those of us on this panel, um, me as moderator and the rest of you on the panel, um, we also think about open science hardware as an alternative approach to uh, thinking about the scientific community's reliance on proprietary equipment um, that is also often expensive uh, and tools and supplies. <clears throat> and so we think um, as a group that <laughs> open science hardware has the potential to change how we think about scientific tools and how they're developed and utilized. Um, and with the sort of public policy perspective, thinking about government and its unique opportunity to align um, scientific tools with the public good and orienting a mission with the funding and procurement of scientific hardware. And so the panelists in this session are gathered here um, because we collectively make up um, sort of the open science, open source hardware section of the open science policy sprint, which there's a number of sessions happening, I think, concurrently and also later in the day, um, focusing on um, proposals from the open science policy sprint, which was a partnership led by uh, the Federation of American Scientists. I think Jordan is here. Um, looking for sourcing and developing actionable policy ideas that are aimed at improving scientific transparency, equity, and innovation. And so we had a whole range of participants um, that came from academic, nonprofit, and patient advocacy communities, um, and a, a wide range of expertise across scientific disciplines and frameworks. I think somebody somebody's unmuted. Um, so take a quick look at that. And so this partnership with Federation of American Scientists with the Center of Open Science and the Wilson Center, um, we were aimed at advancing new and ambitious <laughs> policy ideas related to open science generally. Um, and represented here, we have the submissions related to open source hardware and open science hardware. Um, so throughout these three recommendations that we'll talk about today, um, they really highlight the transformative impact of integrating open source hardware into federal policy and processes. Um, and we will talk about how prioritizing open source solutions to scientific tools um, and recognizing their value for science and for the public, uh, we can think about a more inclusive and interconnected scientific community, uh, accelerate innovation, and also make federally funded research more accessible. So I will um, introduce this panel and we'll hear from each panelist for about 10 minutes, 10 to 12 minutes about their specific policy proposal and also how they sort of come to this space in thinking about um, open science hardware in a 
uh, policy context. Um, and then we'll save the remaining time for discussion. I have a couple questions, but also welcome all of your questions from the audience to kick us off and um, finish out our, I think it's hour and 15 minutes of um, discussion with any of your questions. So go ahead and ask your questions in the chat and I will um, keep those all in mind and sort of collect them for the discussion at the end. So our panelists, and I'll introduce all three of them now, and then we'll sort of run through uh, each of them as we go. We have Shannon Dozmegan, who directs the Open Environmental Data Project. Um, and OEDP focuses on building spaces to grow the global conversation on environmental and climate data access and use. She's the co-founder of the Gathering for Open Science Hardware, um, and also serves on the boards of the Open Science Hardware Foundation and Code for Science and Society. We have Michael Weinberg, who's the executive director of the Engelberg Center on Innovation, Law and Policy at NYU Law, and the co-director of the Glam E Lab and a longtime board member of the Open Source Hardware Association. And then finally, Alicia gibbs Seidel um, is an advocate for open hardware, a researcher and a hardware hacker. Alicia is the founder and executive director of the Open Source Hardware Association, which is a nonprofit organization to educate on the benefits of building and using open source hardware. So very relevant today. Um, so thanks to all three of you. Um, we'll start with Shannon, kick us off, please. Great, thank you. All right, let me get these slides up. Hopefully it works still. Okay. Can you all see yeah. my screen? Oh, thank gosh. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's always a good sign. Um, well, great to be with uh, colleagues today, and thank you, Allison, for the, the generous um, introduction. Um, and really excited to talk about these topics. Um, again, my name is Shannon Dosmegan, and um, I worked on a policy memo actually with Allison um, related to building capacity for agency use of open science hardware. Um, I, in my you know daily life, uh, really focus on the uh, environment, and I came um, to thinking about open hardware uh, probably, what year is it? You know, like 15, 16, 17 years ago um, when I was doing uh, community-based environmental monitoring in um, Louisiana. And so I uh, really was thinking about accessibility and what it means um, to have the power of data um, and, the you know, what hardware can, can play into data um, as part of community process and thinking about uh, questions related to their environment. So that's kind of how I've gotten here. But um, as Allison mentioned, have been really involved in the open scientific hardware community through through the Gathering for Open Science Hardware, GOSH, um, and as serving as a board member for the Open Science Hardware Foundation most recently. Um, Allison and I have worked together um, a lot on policy related to open scientific hardware um, alongside many of our colleagues who are on this call today and others in GOSH community. Um, and that has been everything from um, open hardware and US public policy to open scientific hardware and environmental monitoring um, for technology transfer offices, um, thinking about it in the context of the sustainable development goals, um, and then also uh, working with funder salons uh, to think about better incorporation of open hardware um, into funding practices. Okay, and our slides are advancing. That's also a good sign. Um, so, in our work uh, for the policy sprint, we prioritized addressing the creation, use, and procurement of tools for agency science um, as federal agencies rely almost entirely on proprietary instrumentation. Um, so for example, the Environmental Protection Agency and partners in all uh, US EPA regions um, operate air sensor loan programs um, where sensors are available for local communities to take out. Um, the sensors you know, provided by these programs can cost less than a thousand dollars. They're easy to use. Um, they're designed for non-scientists. Um, but these programs use commercially available air sensor models that are from various manufacturers, um, none of them being open source. And so we think this is really a missed opportunity um, because open source hardware can offer you know, significant benefits to federal agencies, um, also to the creators and users of scientific tools, um, and then to the you know, broad uh, scientific ecosystem. Um, Allison has already given this definition, but I'm gonna do it again because I know it can be a bit to get your head around. Um, but so as defined by the gathering for open science hardware, open science hardware is any physical tool that is 
used for scientific investigations. It can be obtained, assembled, used, studied, modified, shared, and sold by <clears throat> anyone. So it can include um, standard lab equipment as well as auxiliary materials such as um, sensors, biological reagents, uh, analog and digital electronic components. Um, and really beyond being a set of scientific tools, um, it also can be an alternative approach for the scientific, commu uh, scientific community's reliance on expensive and proprietary um, equipment and tools and also the supplies that are put into them. Um, it's growing uh, very quickly, um, especially in academia. Um, you know, they'll see there's new networks, journals, publications, events uh, that are crossing different um, institutions and disciplines. Um, and there's a really strong case to be made, uh, as many people on this call are doing, um, for open science hardware and the, the service of, um, you know, things such as the UN Sustainable Development Goals um, as a collaborative solution to challenges in environmental monitoring, um, and then increasing the impact of research through technology transfer. Um, it's been pretty limited so far, but there are some federal agencies that are supporting open um, science hardware. And, you know, this can look like uh, open source build-it-yourself rover, uh, the development of infrastructure such as NIH 3D, which is a platform for sharing 3D printing files. Um, and then programs um, such as what the National Science Foundation is running around the pathways to enable open source ecosystems. Um, so we really, you know, believe that if federal agencies, um, you know, use and contributed to open science hardware for their own science, it would have a pretty transformative effect um, on the scientific ecosystem. Um, there are key issues, um, and one of them that we focused quite a bit on in our memo, which I, you know, encourage you to read is um is that uh procurement practices are very complex you know if you're in federal agencies i'm sure that you know this um, they're time intensive and they can be difficult to navigate um, the developers and users of open science hardware you know often will lack the capacity and specialized staff that's uh, needed to then compete um, in these federal procurement opportunities um, but there's recent innovations that can demonstrate how federal government can change how it buys and thinks about and uses equipment um, and supplies um, so, for instance, uh, NOAA, NASA, NIST have all developed um, innovative procurement strategies that allow for more fle uh, flexible and responsive government purchasing and also provide in-house expertise um, to procurement officers on using these models in agency contexts. Um, and these teams are providing much needed infrastructure for continuing to expand the understanding and use of creative mission-oriented procurement approaches, um, you know, which can also then support open science science hardware for agency missions. Um, and then agencies such as EPA, NOAA, and USDA are also really well positioned to benefit greatly um, and make contributions to this open scientific ecosystem. Um, you know, they've demonstrated interest in open source tools. For example, uh, you know, NOAA's Technology Partnerships Office um, has supported the commercialization of open science hardware that is included in the NOAA technology marketplace, um, which can look like an open source ocean temperature and depth logger and a sea uh, temperature si uh, sensor that's designed by researchers and partners um, in NOAA. Um, they, these agencies also have a significant need for scientific instrumentation, um, and they, you know, are often developing really customized solutions for agency science um, with, you know, coupled with a commitment to public participation um, and broadening public participation in science, open source, um, open scientific hardware, open source hardware um, could really be in benefit of these agencies' missions. Um, so in our policy memo, we offer recommendations for uh, GSA and then also specific agencies. And I'm just going to note several here. Uh, there's more in our policy memo. So, I, you know, I encourage you to uh, head over there and read all of them. Um, but specifically for GSA, um, to build capacity for the use of open science hardware, um, we suggest things such as creating an interagency community of practice for federal staff that are working on open source related topics um, and directing the technology transformation services to create boilerplate language for the procurement of open source hardware that's um, compliant with federal acquisition authority and the America Competes Reauthorization Act of 2010. Um, specific to agencies such as EPA, 
NOAA and USDA um, in an attempt to build capacity for the use of um, open science hardware. Uh, they could undertake activities such as tasking agency representatives to identify agency scientific instrumentation needs that are most amenable to open source solutions. Uh, so, for example, you know, the EPA Office of Research and Development um, could use and contribute to open source air quality sensors for research on spatial and temporal variations in air quality. And the USDA could use and contribute to um, an open source soil testing kit. And actually, USDA has some um, demonstrated input into this type of work with a project called Open Team. Um, they could also task agency challenge and prize coordinators with working on intra-agency um, challenge or prize competitions to help create an open source option for one of the identified scientific instrumentations or sensors that um, meet agency quality requirements. So overall, um, you know, our argument is that defaulting to open science hardware for agency uh, science is going to result in an open library of tools for science that are replicable, customizable, and result in a much higher return on investment for um, federal agencies. Um, and then at the same time, beyond this, uh, you know, prioritizing open science hardware and agency science allows all kinds of institutions, organizations, communities, and individuals to contribute in meaningful ways to agency science uh, goals um, that can build upon the different collaborative efforts um, of everyone. So, um, that is what I would like to tell you today, and I have a number of resources and links, um, and I encourage you to check them all out, um, and then I'm going to stop there and say that I really look forward to hearing from Michael and Alicia on their topics. Great. Thank you, Shannon. I will turn now to Michael to all talk right. about making... Yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, no, Rash. <laughs> I was, was just mostly all say. right. Like, is this going to, is this, uh, am I going to successfully share my screen? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell us about making government funded hardware open source by default. Fantastic. Uh, thank you. And yeah, thank you everyone for coming together. I think this is an exciting group of people and it's a, it's a topic that I think is very ripe. So I'm glad to be able to talk about a small part of it, which is um, make federally funded hardware open by default. And, um, you know, I'm going to talk about why why that might be useful, why I think that's a good idea, but like pretty much that's like, that's it, right? Like make it open <laughs> by default. I think that's that's the idea, right? That, that's the joke um, is that this is an idea that if we were talking 10 or 15 years ago, I think we would need to spend a lot of time explaining the kind of value of open and why open is, is important generally. But the good news now is that uh, that work has been done by many of the people on this call. And so we can piggyback on work that's been done in open spaces already to really focus on uh, the kind of small, I think relatively small tweak to make sure that we are expanding it to hardware as well. And so, I mean, the, the reason that this presentation is necessary, the reason this idea is necessary to discuss is that we do have these existing requirements for openness that I think we're many of us are very familiar with, right? Um, all sorts of requirements for open code, right? If you if you create code, you need to open source it. Uh, if you do a journal article or you write some sort of written product, you need to release it under make it publicly available under a kind of Creative Commons license or something similar. And so these are ideas that are very comfortable, but there is this gap around hardware. And that gap is around hardware kind of in two ways, right? One way is the hardware that you, you create in the lab to do the experiments, right? To do what you, to do the work you are doing. Oftentimes that hardware is kind of created on an ad hoc basis. Uh, it may not be the prettiest hardware in the world, but it is a, a critical part of what you are doing. And, you know, the software that you created, you might end up open sourcing and you might describe the hardware maybe in passing or in some level of detail in an article, but you usually don't think very much about specifically releasing the hardware documentation itself in a way that would allow you, allow someone else to like really reconstruct and use it. And so that's the gap that we're talking about filling is a kind of explicit requirements to release hardware, both hardware that was used to create, they were kind of used in the lab as part of the experience while you're doing the science, but sometimes also hardware that is the output of the research, right? There are all sorts of examples where the hardware itself is the output 
And so making it explicit that that hardware has to be open, has to be available, uh, has to be something that other people can use and build on and, and take apart is also a really important element of this. So that's the gap that uh, the proposal is really focusing on. I apologize if there's a siren in the background. Uh, I'm in New York. There's sirens everywhere. <laughs> so so the, the benefits of this, I think, will not be a surprise to many of the people on the call, right? The first one is it does reduce that reinvention, right? I think all of us have been in situations where we are doing re research, we are building our own hardware. And in fact, that hardware has been built in parallel uh, in series over the years by many labs in many situations. And so by requiring that that, the, that, that first hardware is made open and available, then every all the follow-on people, if they're lucky, they can just use it and adopt it. Um, but also they may spend their time improving it or customizing it. And that's time that's just better spent than rebuilding something that someone has already sorted out. Um, also just increasing access to information, right? Like this is hardware that is developed. Things are learned when you develop it. Things are customized and making sure that people understand that this is information that has been produced as part of a federal program, a federal grant, as well as the more traditional outputs like a journal article or, you know, I guess what is now a traditional output, which would be open source software or something similar. Another piece of this that is really potentially valuable is as an alternative path to recognition. Um, and so there are lots of situations where, you know, researchers get recognition through citations to journal articles. Researchers also get recognition through patents and being able to say, you know, I have this patent and this is, you know, this is I, I, on, my, on my resume, on my CV, I've got, you know, these patents that I've applied for. And this proposal, just to be clear, is not a, an anti-patent proposal. Um, instead, this is an alternative proposal, right? Because a relatively small amount of hardware that is created will be patented. And so this is a proposal for everything else. And if you have a requirement that people open source their hardware, then as we've talked about, people will you know, use it, build upon it, improve it. And that gives you another path to be recognized as a person who has created the hardware or who has maintained the hardware. This is a path that I think at this point is pretty familiar in the open source software context, but there's a real opportunity to expand that to the open source hardware context. And then the last piece is just the verifiability, right? Being able to say, um, this is this study was done, it was used, it was done doing this during this hard using this hardware. And so when someone else wants to come back and, and try and recreate it, try and understand the data, being able to dig in and say, well, not just sort of this was the this was the setup as described, but I can actually understand the hardware, recreate the hardware, and test the hardware is really critical to making sure that you have full the viability. Now, as I mentioned, I think you know the way to do this is to create a presumption of open, and that, that presumption is a presumption, right? That asterisk is there for a reason. This is not a no patents or everything must be open proposal. I think the proposal is actually much more of a presumption to say the default, the starting point is that the hardware has to be open. But if there are compelling reasons to not make it open, that's fine. Right. As I said, if you are going to be actively patenting that hardware, that's a pretty good reason not to, not to make it open. Uh, there are other kind of sensitive areas that you could imagine not wanting to have a default requirement of openness, but instead to require someone who wants to deviate from the path of openness to be able to explain why and to be able to to challenge that presumption. And so. That's, I think, the, the core of, of the idea is not a kind of all open all the, all the time, but instead that starting presumption of open that allows people to think about it. And then hopefully the majority, probably the vast majority of hardware benefits from that openness in all the ways that I that I flagged. Um, the good news, if you're wondering, uh, and this is, you know, Alicia will talk more about this probably, is that if you're wondering like, well, you know, do we have a good definition of open hardware? Uh, Shannon already talked about the definition of open science hardware, which I think is incredibly useful. Oshawa also maintains a community definition of open hardware. It's existed for over a decade now. It's pretty widely understood. And so we are not in a position where we have to like answer the question, what is open hardware? as a starting point for this. 
Um, and also Oshawa has maintained, maintains a, a certification program that allows people to kind of comply with that definition and announce that they comply with that definition. That also is a program that's been uh, running for a number of years, uh, has hardware from all over, over the world at this point. And so the kind of, can we identify or define open hardware is a problem that I don't wanna say is solved, but is is a pretty mature, the, we've addressed it in a pretty mature way. And so there's a lot of um, things to build on if we're thinking about implementing this. And when we're talking about implementing, I mean, I, th I think that it's, it's you know, these steps are complicated, but the there are not many complicated steps, right? I think the first step in the proposal is an OSTP study on the implementation details. As I said, you know, when you have a presumption of open, you need to think about when that presumption might not hold up, when you might want to allow people to challenge it. And a study would be a great opportunity to give the community a chance to weigh in on when they think uh, what kind of exemptions might make sense and kind of how to draw the lines around that starting presumption. And then once we understand where those lines may be, then it would be time to, for OMB to kind of implement this policy on federal funding. And again, I think it's a real opportunity to piggyback on the work that has already been done around openness more broadly. And instead of trying to kind of create something massive and new and a real kind of shift, this is much more about um, filling in the gaps and being able to say, in addition to other open requirements that we're already very comfortable with and that already kind of work in practice on a day-to-day -day basis, we can make sure that we're also including open hardware in that. Uh, so that's the that, that's the proposal. Um, happy to talk about it more. Thank you again for the opportunity. Hopefully, um, it feels fairly kind of um, non-revolutionary. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I'm not happy to talk more about the kind of implementation details or some of the other benefits, if that's helpful. Thanks, Michael. That's great. Um, let's turn now to Alicia, who will tell us about uh, incorporating open source hardware into patent and trademark office search locations for prior art. Yeah, awesome. Can you see my screen? Great. Okay, so... Yes, I am going to talk about searching open hardware for prior art. So um, I love so far that <laughs> I was like, oh, I should maybe start off with the basis of like, you know, the definition or um, the, uh, the the fact that we have a certification and like it's already been covered in so many ways. It's fantastic. Um, I I really want to tell start by telling a story, though, about um, I think it was a, around uh, 2010 we had an open hardware DC contingent that Michael actually helped put on. Um, and we brought open hardware to Washington DC to, you know, the halls of Congress to show, uh, you know, our congressional leaders what open hardware was. And I had so many Congress people and staffers take out their pocket constitution and say, but patents are in the constitution. You can't do open hardware. Um, and so it is so refreshing uh, to me to have had this year of open hardware that has been sanctioned by the U.S. government. And I just, I really feel like the tides are turning and it's a really powerful time within our movement. So I am super, super excited for that. Um, so yeah, and as Allison said, I am Alicia Gibbs Seidel and I am the executive director of the Open Source Hardware Association. Um, and I also co-founded the Open Hardware Summit with um, Aya Badir and that's coming up in May and the last slide talks a little bit about that if you're interested in coming to um, our summit as well. So to start off, um, here's just a really brief history of open hardware and there's many pieces also missing in this. Um, but I always just like starting with the fact that like the kind of open hardware that we are talking about right now was first coined kind of in 1997. And prior to that, right, prior to like everybody and their brother who's an inventor and a genius in their garage, whatever, um, getting patents in recent history when, when patents have really ramped up. Prior to that, like, I mean, open hardware was all around us, right? It's it's constantly in cooking and in families passing down recipes. It's in fixing vehicles before they had gotten all computerized and whatnot. Now that's a little harder. Um, it was the, the basics of life for hundreds of years before us, right? 
Um, but as we're talking about it now and how it relates to like open science and, and open science hardware, um, really started in 1997. Um, Asha was formed in 2012. So as Michael said, we are fairly mature in this world of open hardware, though we have a lot um, of, of pathways to take, certainly. Um, and in um, 2016, we also launched our certification program, which I think is really important to this sort of particular uh, policy that I wrote around the USPTO searching for prior art within our certification policy. Um, so as people have mentioned here is our communal definition of open source hardware. Um, I do think it's really interesting. I, I mean, so many people have said it, so I won't go on about it, but I do think it's really interesting that this definition originally was spurred out of the industry, out of industry leaders who said the patent system really isn't working for me and I need an alternative. And so again, like Michael said, we are not trying to like, you know, say that there's, there's absolutely no patents and we can only do open hardware, but we just want it to be an option in the landscape of intellectual property. And then also we have this certification and the certification um, basically verifies that your source is there, that you can call your thing open source hardware and it, it does comply with the open hardware definition. Um, we also give you a country code and a unique identifier. Um, and uh, we are we have certified projects on every continent except for Antarctica. So if there's any scientists here working on the Antarctica station, please consider certifying that hardware so we can say that there's open hardware on every continent. Um, the unique identifier number also allows people to look up your open hardware within our database, um, which, the open hardware, uh, getting a certification creates this database. Um, this is a screenshot of our database, which is a little bit outdated because I know we've, uh, we're now, uh, we now have over 2,700 uh, projects in our database. So I know this is 25, 33 projects, but we have more than that now. Um, so this is really important that it creates a database. Um, so we have, this freely available database. And I should mention, it's also free to get a certification. We do not charge money for it. Anybody can get one. Um, and this database basically um, captures all where all the source code is to these projects. Um, the certification date, it kind of categorizes the project type. Um, and then like, you know, we mentioned it gives the country code and the... Um, <laughs> Uh, the country code and the unique identifier number. Um, we also have an open hardware facts generator, which is a nice uh, little spot that you can put all of your various licenses in a, in a really clean format. So people understand like, oh, the hardware is licensed this way, the software is licensed this way, and the documentation is licensed this way. And I think this is one of the main differences between hardware and software is that there are a lot more pieces and parts and while we do share the source, it might be harder to share atoms rather than bits. Um, it's not just freely available, which is why we do um, ensure that all the hardware licenses um, are okay to be resold. You have to be able to make money from mining atoms if you're going to mine atoms. Um, but this basically shows everybody the licenses that you have chosen uh, to certify your project with. Okay, so why is this important? for open science and for, you know, the USPTO to do um, searches, right? So here is Ash was asked to the USPTO is to incorporate open source hardware into patent searches for prior art using the open hardware certification database. And I think this is incredibly um, important because science is inherently, inherently leverages replicability, right? So the entire industry of science kind of couches themselves in how can we replicate the research to know that it's factual, to know that the theory is correct. So when we're talking about replicability, the way to do that oftentimes is through openness. Um, however, it's really hard to make sure that your project will stay open if, um, if all of the different agencies aligned, such as the USPTO, aren't also educated about open source hardware. And we've unfortunately seen open hardware get patented over. Um, so we need these agencies uh, to have the regulations and the policies that match the year of open hardware initiatives. 
um, or the year of open science initiatives. Um, so this is the Hang 3D printer. And this 3D printer is open source hardware and the prior art was openly available online. Um, and this is an example of hardware that, um, that, that somebody else was able to get a patent on um, just copying the exact innovation, which is um, which was the Hang 3D printer. <clears throat> and um, the creator of the open hardware 3D printer uh, was able to go through the process and, and get the finances to um, fight this patent. And um, it was revoked, but it took, um, you know, a lot of, uh, of, of extra funding and time of everybody involved, including the USPTO. Um, and this is, you know, unfortunately not the only example. So um, if you search at the Electric Frontier Foundation, you can find other examples where the USPTO has missed prior art. Um, and is patented over open projects. Um, and there are even scientific uh, um, organizations that are publicly funded that feel um, that have had their open hardware patented over by the USPTO and feel that bringing that to, um, you know, uh, to the public would, would make the public feel like that was a waste of their taxpayer dollars. And so they have not challenged that patent, unfortunately, because they don't want to be seen as wasting taxpayer dollars. So we do see this as a problem in open source hardware and one, but one that can be fixed through these initiatives. Mm -hmm. um, so the other thing is that you all, all the scientists and research, researchers, um, you all should have your rights respected. And if you want to provide the world with open source hardware, um, you know, all of the different government agencies should absolutely be searching your prior art so that you can be rest assured that your hardware will stay open. So that is the basis of my talk is just please USPTO search our database. Um, I've got my contact information there on the side. And as mentioned, um, we are having um, the Open Hardware Summit in Montreal, May 3rd and 4th. Um, the URL is 2024.osho.org. Tickets are on sale now, and our lineup of speakers is also available. So if you want to talk more about open hardware and how it relates to science or how it just relates in general to the entire world, um, we will be in Montreal May 3rd and 4th to talk about that. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Alicia. Okay, so we've heard from all three of our panelists, um, and now we will open it up for questions um, and answers um, and, and discussion. And we have until 1.20, so we have just about 10 minutes. So please, if you have questions, uh, go ahead and put them in the chat. I will give you the option to state it verbally since we are in meeting format, um, but or I'll also read it out if you prefer. Um, but I'll ask a few questions to start us off, um, but... Um, don't hesitate to add yours so we can shift over to all of your questions as well. So to, to get us started, I'm going to ask a couple questions, I think, about the relationship of open hardware with open science in general, because as that's the meeting or the overall topic for um, our meeting today and tomorrow, and that, and sometimes I think we've all observed, those of us um, that have spoken already today that open science hardware is not always included in open science conversations. Um, and so my first question is, is why should it? So why does open hardware need to be included? And some of you have already addressed this in your, um, your talks, um, but just to, to restate and to highlight the most important aspects of it, why does it need to be part of the open science conversation? Um, and then, from there, we'll talk a little bit more about how hardware is sort of similar and different to other elements of the open science conversation. But starting with that big picture, um, why should we talk about hardware? I'll start. Um, Michael, you talked about a lot about this in your presentation, but so if you could just recap what you said, and then we'll jump to Alicia and Shannon. Yeah, and I will. I will defer to Shannon on this, but I think. Um, I mean, look. I mean, uh, hardware is an important part of open science because hardware is an important part of science, right? And like you, 
you are using hardware, you're developing hardware, you're relying on hardware when you are doing good science and you're doing good research. And so to exclude it is is something that means you're missing you're missing the larger picture. And this is something that I think it's, you know, there's there's sort of historical reasons why hardware has lagged behind other parts of science and of, of openness, uh, mostly to do with, as we should touch on, the kind of atoms are more complicated than bits. But at this point, I think we have established kind of open hardware is very viable and open science is very viable. And so this is a kind of a moment to, to bring those two pieces together and to recognize the important role that hardware plays in science and how, how much we can benefit from including hardware in our thinking about open science. Alicia? Yeah, I'll just go back to the fact that, you know, science and replicability co go hand in hand, right? And so if you want to replicate a scientific study, you might get different results if you're using totally different pieces of hardware and different calibrations on your hardware and things like that. And so I think open hardware can really help the replicability of science in general. Anything to add, Shannon? Yeah, I would just, um, I, you know, second what both my colleagues have said, but um, also would add um, that, you know, when we, when we're in the year of open science, I think a lot of um, attention was put on, uh, you know, open access uh, publication um, to, you know, more or less, uh, you know, open data. Um, and what that can end up missing is um, the argument for open infrastructure. Um, and so thinking about hardware, not only as um, the physical tools of science, um, but actually also as a part of the critical infrastructure that can make up um, larger scientific programs um, within federal agencies. Thanks. Um I think we should drill down just a little bit into thinking about open source hardware um, as being sort of similar to as well as different from open source software, since many of our um, participants here may be more familiar with open source software. Um, and especially from a policy perspective, since that's what we're talking about today. So when you're thinking about policy, um, are there aspects of hardware that make policy about open source hardware different from policy about open source software? Like how should, if a policymaker is coming to this conversation fresh, doesn't necessarily know much about open source hardware, but does know about open source software, what would you tell them about hardware um, to sort of go in with that effective knowledge? Um, does anybody want to volunteer to start? I can volunteer to start. I think, I just feel like, like having, you know, the USPTO search this is one of the policy points where it is so different, right? With copyright, you're automatically granted that copyright. So with software, you can put whatever license on your software and run with it. And like everybody understands that and the court systems understand that. Um, but, you know, with hardware, it's it's fairly different. There's this whole prior art notion. There's, you know, whether or not, you know, in, in the early days of open hardware, we would, we would kind of like wring our hands about, wait, do we need a patent? And then we have to license that patent or would the government actually say like oh okay so you just you stuck a license on something that was unpatented and that's okay too um and so we we had like tons of discussions about that um and kind of landed where we did where we we think that you know just licensing to hardware with an open hardware license will suffice and then we got that certification um and that kind of creates this sort of public no norm of what people are doing with their open hardware and open science hardware. And maybe Michael can talk about this more as, as a, a lawyer. Um, but I think that that's a huge difference and, and a scary difference for, for non-legal people within our community, right? It's kind of saying like, oh, okay, I understand open source software. And like, you just stick one of those licenses on it, but I don't understand where hardware is coming from and the process of what I have to do. And that's one of the things that Oshawa really tries to help out with. And currently we're in talks with a a bunch of different tech transfer offices and OSTP or oh, OSPOs <laughs> um, to talk about what is the process of opening a hardware in an institution or a university. Excellent. Michael, Shannon? Um, did you want to follow on that, Michael? I know Alicia kind of tagged you in. But. Uh, yeah, yeah <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try and be quick. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think the good news is to a first approximation, 
if someone is coming in and saying, I'm familiar with open source software, uh, tell me about open source hardware policy. The answer is they're basically the same, right? Like the, at, the, at the kind of conceptual level, it's the same. A lot of what you're thinking about with software, you can transfer over to hardware. Um, but as Alicia said, when you get into the details, you do get that complexity of hardware, right? Hardware is made up of a lot of different components that have a lot of different kinds of documentation. They have a lot of different relationships to intellectual property law. Um, but I think the, the other good news is the last 10 years of open hardware, open science hardware, a lot of the work has been done in the community to try and standardize and simplify that experience. I won't say that we've reached the point where open source software is, um, but you aren't kind of out, out on an island on your own, right? There are pretty clear pathways to follow. It's slightly more complex conceptually, but I think that in practice, we're really, we're really moving towards um, a level of simplicity that is very similar to kind of at, at the application level um, as open source software. So there are differences, uh, but you can get pretty deep before you have to worry about those differences, so I guess would be my takeaway. <laughs> Um, yeah, I generally, I agree. I, I do think, um, you know, and Allison and I, um, we, before we started working on some of the open science hardware stuff together, we, uh, I was on a FACA for EPA and Allison was, uh, working alongside me, um, on writing recommendations. And, um, so we've, we've been really interested, you know, in thinking about the environmental space. Um, and I think the environmental space is, is, uh, a, a kind of curious case in, um, the, the difference and what open science hardware um, and open source software um, kind of prevent, or, or I'm sorry, present for public policy. Um, and, you know, it's it's things such as um, looking at the, the differences and how they're built and maintained. I mean, just, you know, taking taking uh, open practices licenses into the physical world uh, presents different um, complexities when you're thinking about documentation um, and you're thinking about things such as uh, maintenance and, and procurement. Um, I also think it, uh, it gives us um, really interesting ways uh, and us meaning um, the open science hardware, open source hardware communities, um, and then also federal agencies. Um, it gives us different ways to think about what public engagement could look like. Um, and I saw somebody mentioned, you know, standards in the, the chat. Um, you know, and when I'm on calls with uh, folks from EPA or other state environmental um, monitoring agencies, you know, the, the thing that comes up again and again is like, well, you know, the sensor reads like 0 0.10 whatever off. Um, and so we just can't use it. Like, we'll never be able to use something like this. But, you know, what if we like try to switch some of these, um, you know, kind of conversational paradigms and said, no, this actually gives us a really good opportunity to figure out what a collaboration between, you know, federal agencies and um, open science hardware developers could look like so we can start solving um, or thinking actually differently about uh, enforcement and compliance tools, you know, in the, the environmental context. So um, I, I think it, you know, in general, um, there are, there are some differences, but there's also just like a number of opportunities that may be a bit different from um, open source software. Let's follow that thread a little bit. You mentioned the comment in the chat about standards. So, um, Sam, feel free to come off mute if you'd like to ask your question. Otherwise, I will ask it for you. Um, sure. Thanks for the opportunity, and and thanks for referencing the comment. Um, yeah, I was curious where standards fit into this landscape. And Shannon, you kind of got at that. Um, I work with researchers who often use standards as a foundation to develop hardware and instrumentation, and they tend to be fairly hard to access, expensive to access, I guess, closed in shorthand. So yeah, I'm just curious kind of where that fits in this landscape of patents, licensing. Is it endpoint, beginning point? Is, is it just like a totally different thing? Um, so yeah, thanks for considering. Thoughts? Oh. Alicia. Oh, I was just gonna say, I know for, I mean, for Ashwa, I feel like this is like, it's kind of a big headache, right? It is, it is a huge, I don't know what the right word is, monster out there, <laughs> I'm gonna say, but it really, it really does. I mean, in terms of equability, it cuts so many people out, right? Standards are incredibly expensive just to access, just to access what the standard is, to be able to download and read that information is effectively, as you said, closed. Um, and the industries, 
you know, the, the industries that have these standards are making money off of them. So it's, it's their bread and butter, right? They don't want to not charge for these, for the use of these standards. Um, and for several domains, you have to have the standard to be taken seriously or to even build the hardware itself. Um, so it is, it is really, um, it's, it's a, it's a big problem really, um, to be able to, to really go into all different fields of research. Um, I think that it is one of the most prohibitive things out there. Um, I actually, I actually think the standards create a little bit of an opportunity, right? Because I mean, standards are expensive; they're behind paywalls. But if you are building hardware that is compliant with the standard, you can open source the hardware, and you can even open source the hardware and say that it is compliant with the standard. Now, that's not the same as getting access to the standard if you're trying to build something or trying to meet that standard. But if you have a starting point that you know is compliant with the standard, that is open and well documented and accessible. That is that may be useful in a lot of different contexts for a lot of people who don't have the ability to directly access or easily access those standards, especially you know over time, if you have a number of different implementations that are all open and all meet the standard, uh, it does prevent, uh, provide an opportunity <laughs> to understand that standard without having access to that standard. Um, I think we're at time, if not past, uh, yes. Sam, I'm just going to drop um, my colleague and I wrote a, uh, a blog about this um, when we were doing work on environmental monitoring in case you want to check it out. Yeah, it sounds like we need a whole other conversation about standards. Um, so I'm going to wrap us up since we are over time. Thank you so much to everybody who joined um, and especially to our panelists. Um, I will put a plug in here for at at 2.30 Eastern today, in, in about an hour, um, we'll hear a little bit more about hardware in the um, grassroots initiatives and communities plenary, um, where we'll hear about the, the gathering for open science hardware um, and others. So thank you to all of you. Let's um, keep talking about um, hardware in the context of open science um, and feel free to get in touch with any of us. I, I believe this is all recorded and um, our bios are accessible on the website. So. Thanks a lot. See you next time.